But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The date is September 12th, 1962. Then President John F. Kennedy delivers his famous We Choose to Go to the Moon speech to the crowd at Rice University in Houston. Seven years later, this dream would be accomplished with the Apollo 11 mission, landing American Neil Armstrong on the moon's surface. But how did we get here? And how did we go from this to this? What caused NASA to lose control of its space monopoly? Why are companies even interested in space? And what dangers could this create? This is how space became privatized, because the second space race has already begun. After defeating the Axis powers in World War II, the alliance between the United States and Soviet Union was beginning to unravel, ushering in a new era of tensions known as the Cold War. The growing fear of nuclear weapons and overall mistrust between the countries resulted in multiple confrontations, including the Berlin Blockade in 1948 and the Korean War in 1950. But in 1955, these tensions would be taken to a new height, far above the sky. The Soviets landed the first blow in October of 1957, successfully launching Sputnik 1, the first ever Earth-orbiting satellite. They struck again in November with Sputnik 2, sending a dog named Laika into orbit, officially becoming the first ever country to send a living organism into space. <laughs> However, the US responded in late January of 1958, with their own satellite called Explorer 1, leading to the discovery of the Van Allen radiation belt. This type of back and forth game went for a few years, with each country making small strides here and there. Like the US launched the first weather satellite, the USSR reached the surface of the moon and took this picture of it. The US sent a monkey into space, and the USSR sent not one, but two dogs into space. You get the idea. But all these victories were just that, small strides, and nothing quite definitive. Until, in 1961, history happened. April 12th, 1961. Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin makes a single orbit around Earth, becoming the first man ever in space. Now many people claim this was a nail in the coffin. The Soviet Union was officially the winner of the space race, meaning that their nation and way of life were indeed superior, or whatever this was about. But the United States had other ideas. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. On July 16, 1969, the Apollo 11 spacecraft successfully lands on the moon. Moments later, American astronaut Neil Armstrong becomes the first person ever to touch foot on its surface. Upon his arrival, he said these famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This changed the tide, flipped the script, and changed the course of history forever. And may consider this to have single-handedly won the race for the U.S. Though this claim is debatable. The government spent over $400 million on the moon landing project, and the American public, for the most part, were ecstatic about the progress being made. With the people behind them, the future of NASA was looking bright. But in the years to come, all of that was about to change. Thank you. 
After the moon landing, as we creep into the 1970s, people start to gradually lose interest in the discoveries that NASA is making. And many fairly ask the question, should space exploration be a top priority? After all, we have much larger issues like political upheaval, rising inflation, and of course, the Vietnam War. In July of 1970, NASA's budget is reduced to around 1.92% of annual investments, and the government no longer agrees to fully fund their projects. This is because they didn't feel like anything NASA was doing was even on the playing field of the moon landing, which happened the previous year. If you're curious, the missions after Apollo 11 were Apollo 12 through 17, landing more men on the moon, conducting research, and bringing back moon rock samples, followed by the Skylab program, sending the first space station into orbit. Still pretty cool stuff in my opinion, but I could see how it wouldn't be quite as interesting as, you know, Apollo 11. Fast forward to the 1980s. Then President Ronald Reagan signs the Commercial Space Launch Act of 1984. Now this act changed a few different things. Firstly, it allowed private companies to develop commercial launch vehicles and orbital satellites. Secondly, it allowed them to operate private launch sites to test said creations. Finally, it mandated NASA to actively encourage these developments. This act was huge in the privatization of space for the reasons that I just mentioned, but even more major leaps were yet to come. In 2004, President George W. Bush passed the U.S. Space Exploration Policy, funding private companies in the development of rockets so as not to rely on the Russian space program for transportation. Although this policy wasn't fully in effect as the United States relied on Russia for the next two decades, it certainly inspired the initiative taken by the companies I'll discuss in the next segment. After selling his company PayPal, entrepreneur Elon Musk starts his spaceflight company SpaceX in May of 2002. His plan to make liquid-fueled rockets both affordable and reusable. Four years later in 2006, Musk launches his first rocket, funded only by private companies like Boeing and Lockheed Martin. Its compact Merlin engine made it more cost-effective than any rocket produced by NASA at the time. However, less than a minute into the flight, Falcon 1 plummeted to the ground due to a gas line leak and subsequent fire. In March of 2007, one year after the prior failure, SpaceX launched its second rocket, carrying a prop satellite. This was considerably more successful than the first flight, but still failed to get into orbit due to a problem in stage separation. In 2008, SpaceX launched its third rocket, carrying the Trailblazer satellite for the US Air Force and two additional NATO satellites. This time, stage separation was successful, but due to evaporating fuel in the Merlin engine, it was unable to get into orbit. The failure of these first three rockets pushed SpaceX to the verge of bankruptcy. But later in 2008, with all of the funds they had available, SpaceX launched their fourth rocket in the Falcon 1 series. Unlike the other three rockets, this one was successful in placing the satellite into orbit. After this success, SpaceX received a $1.6 billion contract from NASA to bring cargo to the International Space Station. Falcon 9 conducted 19 flights from 2010 to 2015, 18 of which were successful. With this success, SpaceX was able to get a contract from NASA to send astronauts to the International Space Station worth over $2.6 billion. In May of 2020, SpaceX launched NASA astronauts Robert Binkin and Douglas Hurley into orbit, becoming the first private company ever to do this. Today, there are tons of private spaceflight companies out there. Most notably recently, Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin and Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic, both with the same goal of transporting civilians into space. With NASA continuing to give more power to privatization, they're going to have to rely on these companies more than ever to do many of the tasks they would have done themselves just decades prior. But what is the danger of private entities like SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Virgin Galactic taking power, and billionaires like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson controlling the sky?
Some of the proponents of privatizing space point to the fact that it will lead to lower costs, higher level research, and even create a robust space economy. All of which is done, and all signs suggest they will continue to do that. As we saw with SpaceX, they weren't afraid of failure like NASA has been in the past, because the consequences are not as severe. With that being said, there have been some concerns brought by opponents of space privatization, which I believe should be considered. Firstly is the potential safety concerns. Spaceflight companies are controlled by a board of directors, and in a capitalist economy, their main priority is profit. That, coupled with the apparent fact that space is an extremely dangerous place and accidents can happen when launching rockets, opponents fear that keeping costs low and development time short could be a recipe for disaster. Secondly, is that with how valuable resources are in space, you can see figures like Elon Musk obtain an almost godlike amount of wealth. For example, in 2020, a metal asteroid was discovered that was worth an estimated 10,000 quintillion dollars, more than the entire economy of the Earth. Now imagine if that type of wealth got in the hands of one individual, or even a single country. Finally is the environmental concern. In 2022, there were an estimated 186 launches worldwide. But as privatization starts to grow, and more spaceflight companies start to pop up, that number will only get larger. For example, the CEO of SpaceX said the company eventually plans to carry out three or more launches a day, over a thousand yearly. But what do you think? Do you believe the benefits of privatization outweigh the potential negatives? What policies can the government pass to regulate this new industry and minimize these dangers? This was a very brief overview of this topic, but I hope you're as interested in it as I am. This is how we went from this to this. This is how NASA lost control of its space monopoly and how companies like SpaceX gained control. The future of space exploration is bright, but it doesn't come without dangers. Are these the companies we want in control of our species' future? Are these the people we want to own the sky?